She is the most beautiful in all the three worlds. And the worlds that we are talking about are the waking state, the dreaming state, and the sleeping state. So she is the Tripura Sundari. She is she manifests herself in all of these three, three states and beyond as well. Bliss. So her practice and her worship, what does she give you? She gives you ananda. She gives you bliss. And immortality. She get, takes you to the state where you do not have the need to come back again and again and again and again in a cycle of births and deaths. So the goal of Sri Vidya is to take you to that state where you become one with the ultimate reality. This is an invocation that we use to welcome the Divine Presence in each and every one of you. So, Shri Matri Namaha, once again. The very first session that we are going to be beginning with today is the Sri Vidya Foundation course. We will get to what Sri Vidya is all about and what is this foundation course that we are talking about. The first thing is that Sri Vidya is Shakti and we are all gathered here to honor and worship Shakti. For many, many, many centuries, women were not allowed to worship Shakti. And it is ironical because the goddess herself is Shakti, right? She is the personification of Shakti. And yet women were kept away from worshipping. In today's times, we see the resurgence of Shakti. She is here very much so within each and every one of us. And we shall see how we go about first this next three days of this foundation course. We'll just take a brief look before we get into the actual um, uh, part of the explanations. So this uh, foundation course is coming to you from Devipuram, which is a small town built, a home built for Devi by Devi. It is close to the city of Vishakhapatnam and it has been founded by the, this the Guru's name is Sri Amrutananda Nath Saraswati in the very first picture that you see. And his mission in life is to propagate Sri Vidya because he himself received direct teachings from the mother and he feels there is no greater honor and um, joy than to know who she is and how to worship her. He had direct experiences with the goddess. Although he uh, moved away from spirituality, he was completely into science. And, uh, you know, we all think that science and spirituality are two different streams. But today we know that the way of the quest is different, but the goal is still the same. So the science also comes around to the spiritual way of looking at things. So we will come to that tomorrow. A little more on his story, we will be doing that tomorrow. Okay, so for today we will start with this. So we will uh, talk about, okay, this whole course was designed by him because he felt that in today's time it is very important to know and to worship, how to worship the goddess. All of us are living on very tight schedules. We don't have time, we have to make time. In the time that is available to us, what can we do? How can we worship her? There are very few people who can say, I don't need a job, I don't need anything, I can you know, spend my time 24-7 doing whatever I wish to do. But for all of us, we are limited by maybe two hours, you can spend two hours or three hours or maybe even less. So, rather than have the tradition completely lost, he felt it is very important that we preserve the tradition and especially all the essential aspects of it must be there. So the core practices are there. At the same time, they are presented in a way that anyone can learn and practice them. It is a practical approach. Sri Vidya is a practical approach to going beyond the limits of what we think we are. 
we have certain perceptions that we are capable of something, we are not capable of so many things. Right? To go beyond those perceptions is what Sri Vidya is all about. So expanding our awareness, expanding our consciousness is what we are talking about here. So in the next few days, we will be uh, also learning briefly about Kundalini and the chakras and also a meditation called Kundalini meditation and Yoga Nidra meditation you are familiar with. But at the same time, we will be talking about that as well a bit. And then the first three chakras of Muladhara, Swadhisthana and Manipura. These are the chakras we will be addressing. And uh, we will learn certain practices, ritual practices, which are at once simple to follow and the benefits are enormous. So this is a sadhana shastra in that you have to practice and as you keep practicing, you will receive the benefits. It's just like any scientific experiment. You do this, you will receive this. You do this set of practices, you will be able to manifest what it is that you are looking for in your life. So that is the power of these practices. So Mahaganapati, the next chakra, Bala and then Chandi at Manipura. And also we will learn a simple way of doing Poma, which is a fire ritual. In today's times, the fire ritual has, is, has been gaining more and more importance. It was a practice that is followed in many, many cultures and it is really important because the external fire, whatever we see in the external, we replicate within ourselves. So as we see that, we increase our fire within us to know more, to understand more. So that what we do externally must rekindle and refire the processes within us. So that, that is another important aspect and that also has been presented in a very simple and easy to follow manner. Okay, so these are the basic things that we will be covering in the next uh, three to four days. So starting now with Sri Vidya. Sri Vidya can be described as a tantra of beauty, bliss and immortality. Beauty, because she is described as Lalita Maha Tripurasundari. She is the most beautiful in all the three worlds. And the worlds that we are talking about are the waking state, the dreaming state and the sleeping state. So she is the Tripura Sundari. She, is, she manifests herself in all of these three, three states and beyond as well. Bliss. So her practice and her worship, what does she give you? She gives you Ananda. She gives you bliss. And immortality. She get, takes you to the state where you do not have the need to come back again and again and again and again in a cycle of births and deaths. So the goal of Sri Vidya is to take you to that state where you become one with the ultimate reality. So that is the goal. You can see a picture of a goddess and you can see a yantra which is there at her feet. She is the goddess whose name is Sri Vidya, Dalita Mahatripal Sundari, Mahakameshwari, many, many names. Sri Vidya, if you break up the word, Sri and Vidya. Sri means auspiciousness. So all that is good, all that is beautiful, all that is wondrous is included in the term of Sri. And Vidya means knowledge. But what knowledge? The knowledge that is gained through experience. So that is not merely factual kind of a knowledge, but it is an experiential knowledge. And that knowledge is the one that she blesses us with. Sa vidya ya vimuktaye. So the knowledge that liberates you, that is the kind of knowledge that she gives us. She is also addressed as Devi. The goddess, another word for goddess is Devi. It's a very common name. Any goddess is called a Devi. And Devi can be defined as Divyate Prakashyate Anaya Iti Devi. So who is Devi? She is the consciousness, the prana shakti that is there in each and every living person. So 
she is there in all the animal kingdom, in all the bird kingdom, everywhere. Everywhere there is life, there is Devi. So Devi acts in us, through us, in so many different ways. It is only because of her presence that our eyes can see, our ears can hear, we can talk, we can walk, and we can do so many different things. Only when she is present can we do all of these things. Sri Vidya is the name of this goddess. Sri Vidya is the path that leads you to her. And Sri Vidya is also the mantra that is chanted to receive her grace. So the word Sri Vidya can include many things. When we, when we say the word Sri Vidya, it is all of these things together. So what is it all about? To each and every one of us, we reach a certain stage in life where we start having big questions. So what is this life all about? Why are all of us created? What is this universe about? So these questions, I'm sure all of us have already come to them because that is why we are here. Otherwise, we wouldn't even be here. Why do I exist? Where did I come from? Where am I going? What is my role and purpose in life? So all of these questions start coming to us and then we start pondering on these things and then ultimately we try to find a way where can I get the answers. In Sri Vidya, or rather even in Hindu philosophy, we have 33 crores of deities. You see. So it is a number that you know we cannot even imagine. So think of 33 crores of devatas is an impossibly large number. Sri Vidya considers the divine pair of Shiva and Shakti to be at the core of all creation. So they represent Shiva is the passive and the inert witness within us. So he doesn't, he just is stay, staying in the background, nothing. He's, everything else happens in front of him. He is just the witness. And Shakti is the one who is the dynamic energy, engaging with the universe. So all of us, we know, we know that there's something, we feel that there is someone else inside us. We can feel when we don't want to, when we sit quietly, we can feel that there is something inside us. And that is the witness within us. And we engage with the whole universe in different ways through Shakti. So Shakti is all about action. She is all about energy and she is all about going out and doing something. Whereas Shiva is just in the background, he is sometimes not even noticeable, but he is there all the time. He is there. So he represents the Nirguna Tattva. So he is formless, he is attributeless, and he is in the background. Shakti, on the other hand, is all that you see. Everything that you see in the entire universe is Shakti. So she has infinite forms, infinite names, everything. They seem to be so different, but they are one and the same. So Shiva and Shakti cannot be separated ever. There is a popular uh, saying, Vina Shakti Shiva Shavaha. So without Shakti, Shiva is like a corpse. So he does not, you know, he is basically inert matter. Whereas once the energy enters him, only then he is able to, uh, you know, do anything. So this cosmic pair of Shiva and Shakti is what Sri Vidya is about. And Devi or the goddess is supposed to be Shiva Shakti Aikya Rupini. She is a combination of both Shiva and Shakti. So we worship the goddess who is this combined form of Shiva and Shakti. Now we are saying that Shiva and Shakti are equal. We are saying that they manifest in a different way. But why then do we focus on Shakti? Why are we not focusing on Shiva? Shakti is like a mother. A mother is probably one of the most closest persons in anybody's life. So you can approach a mother very easily. You can talk to your mother, you can discuss all your problems with her, you can, uh, you know, you can be very free 
with her. So it is easier to relate to the mother than to Shiva because he doesn't want to get involved. He said, you, you have any problem? Go to your mom. <laughs> so, you know, that kind of a thing. So Shiva doesn't want to get involved. Shakti does get involved and we choose, intentionally we choose to worship the mother. Okay. So, so the next uh, slide is also about the Shiva Shakti Aike Rupani. So you can see different ways in how Shiva and Shakti are depic depicted in the same form. Right? You can see the left part of the body is showing Shakti and the right part of the body is showing Shiva. Again, these are connected of course to the energies of the sun and to the moon. So Shakti is related to the energies of the moon and Shiva is related to the energies of the sun. So this, of course, we will come to at a little later. So she is, who is the unity of Shiva and Shakti. That is who the goddess is. That is who Shakti is. So Sri Vidya takes us on this journey where we understand in a step-by-step -step fashion that we are not just this limited consciousness. That we are part of a much, much bigger consciousness, a collective consciousness. And... We know the perfect example of the ocean and the drop. You know that the drop, drops, many, many drops together make up the ocean. So whatever is there in the drop of the ocean is there in the ocean itself. So the collective consciousness, if we consider that to be the ocean, then we are all the fish which are swimming in that ocean, drinking in or taking in the waters of life. It is also a metaphor for the microcosm and the macrocosm. So everything that is there out in the universe on a gigantic scale is also represented within our own bodies in a minuscule scale. So at every stage, this macrocosm, microcosm, you find this pair of Shiva and Shakti everywhere. And Sri Vidya teaches us how to access that collective consciousness through simple rituals. The, the path is highly ritualistic. Because these are time-tested and proven methods. And because of that, you know, if you practice this and this and this, you will be able to manifest this, this and this. So because of that, the power has been experienced by so many people. It is not something that is just out there in the air. So people know that, yes, if I do this, I am going to be able to receive this. So the collective consciousness is what we are all looking for. To expand our consciousness from the limited beings that we are into the much larger consciousness that is there in the entire universe. Now Sri, Sri Vidya is, can be derived or is supposed to be derived from Sri Vidya. Where Sri is a term used for the feminine, the divine feminine or any feminine, any, any fem, female person is referred to as three. So if you break up the syllables, sa, ta, ra and e. Okay? So tamas is the state that we are in, limiting ideas of I and me. So I, me and mine. So our whole existence revolves around this, I, me and mine. Rajas is how you can escape from those limitations. So what are the activities that you can do to start you know, uh, expanding your consciousness and how you can uh, break free of those limitations. Whether it is limiting ideas of who you are, limiting ideas of your emotions, your thoughts, all of these things come into play. Then sattva is the pure knowledge. And E is the will of Kundalini. In Lalita Sahasnamam, which is a chant of a thousand names of the goddess, it says thousand, but the thousand always refers to infinite, right? So, the thousand names of the goddess, it is said she is Maha Sakti Kundalini, Maha Asakti. So, she has a great desire and that desire is that she wishes to merge with Shiva. So, the Devi is conceived to be in the form of the Kundalini Shakti and you all know that she is located in the Muladhara Chakra and Shiva is set to be up in the Sahasrara at the crown center. And she has a great desire to rise and to meet up with Shiva. But she cannot do it by herself. She needs us to make the effort. 
we have to do it because we are lim she is limited in our body so we have to take the effort and we have to make sure that this happens okay so maha asakti that is she is she represents the will of kundalini the ikara is the will of kundalini to transcend so shri vidya teaches you how to let go of bondages so every kind whatever type of spirituality or practices that you follow they always tell you that what you need to get go let go of is attachments right it is not enjoyment per se that is the problem you can enjoy you can do whatever you want you can go to the movies you can go you know meet friends have fun party you can do what you want as long as you are not attached to it the moment you start getting attached to things that's where the problem starts so the, the attachment is how do you let go of these attachments so that is what these practices and what sri vidya teaches us so and adoring nature when we come we see so many things in nature you see a beautiful flower you see a beautiful landscape you see the mountains you see the beautiful rivers and uh, um, you know you are surrounded by beautiful nature there is you cannot compare with the beauty of nature you know just a beautiful sunset a beautiful thing i mean nothing no painting nothing can compare to that and the best part is that it is free right you don't have to own it to enjoy it a beautiful dance program like we witnessed today we enjoyed it right as long as you don't start wanting to claim ownership and say yes this is mine or this flower is mine and you, i can enjoy it only if it belongs to me then the problems start so learning to let go of bondages so adoring nature without any attachments without any desires that is what shri vidya tells us teaches us so that everything is one all of us are one so it is again advaita so what i am seeing externally the whole world that i see around me the whole world that is within me and the deity whom i am worshiping the ultimate reality everything is one but till we get to that state of course we see all the duality all the different kinds of things we need to move from where we are to what we want to become so in sri vidya we commonly say that because she is a mother she gives you both all the bhoga all the desires that you have she will bless you with those and she also blesses you with the desire that you have for spiritual progress or spiritual upliftment whereas there is a, a shloka also given here yatrasti bhogo na tatra moksha so where there is bhoga bhoga means enjoyment of material things that is bhoga there you won't find moksha yatrasti moksha na tu tatra bhoga so where you find moksha you don't find enjoyment of worldly things shri sundari sevena tat paranam bhogascha mokshascha karasta eva so where you find in the upasana of sundari means in the sadhana or the practices of sundari is another name for shri vidya okay so bala tripura sundari lalita maha tripura sundari sundari so wherever she is worshiped you can be assured of both she will take care of all the material desires that you have as well as making sure that you are on the right track for your spiritual progress okay so in fact many people think you know when you are in a, any kind of a spiritual uh, um, practices or anything that you are uh, you know trying to achieve you suddenly become all serious and then you don't you know you don't want to meet friends you don't want to do this you want to do that nothing of that sort you don't have to give up anything you need to enjoy your life because who is devi she is you yourself she is the consciousness within ourselves if you are happy then she is happy so how can you make her happy you have to be happy first you have to say yes to your own happiness if you say yes to your own happiness then devi is happy so that is the ultimate puja that is the ultimate worship you make sure that you are happy and you spread that happiness to everybody else so that is the best form of puja that you can offer there are ritual ways that you do you offer flower you offer a fruit you offer various things that is another way but the most important way is you learn to be happy you offer the happiness that is there within you you offer it to her that is what she wants what can we offer her really if you think of it everything that has been offered 
that is there in the universe has been created by her. So what is it that really we can offer? Or we can say that I have offered. There is no I there. There is only what she has given. So let us enjoy that and think of her when we are, you know, doing that. So that is the seva, that is the worship that she wants. Nothing else from us. Okay. So here now we'll just go a little bit into this uh, uh, pictorial representation. You can see that the goddess is seated on a throne. And the four legs of the throne, or rather the throne is held up by four deities. All right? So where there should be legs of the throne, there are four deities. And she is also seated on a figure. And on either side of her are also two other deities. Okay? So this is how she is represented. And the four deities who are there holding up the throne, they are called Brahma, Vishnu, Rudra and Ishvara. Okay. These four deities are, are uh, responsible for the activities of creation, sustenance, destruction and there are two more functions. So every deity or every ultimate reality when manifest manifestation happens, it has five major functions. Okay? First one is the creation itself. Then is the sustenance. Once something is created, you have to nurture it and you have to take care of it. You have to you know, make sure that it is going well. The third one is the destruction or the dissolution is merging back to where it came from. The fourth one is described as Maya or Tirodhana. So if the ultimate reality has to manifest in a limited form, it has to pass through a certain, you know, certain kind of layers or filters are applied and only then it can be contained in that small form. So that is known as Maya or Tirodhana. And the opposite of that is Anugraha. So merging back again into the ultimate reality. So going again from the small limited consciousness to the vast cosmic consciousness that requires the grace of the goddess, the grace of the ultimate reality and that is described as Shreem, is called as Anugraha. So, Srishti, Sthiti, Laya, Tirodhana and Anugraha. These are the five functions of the deity. Here you can see it in the form of the picture. But if you wish to explain the same thing in the form of yoga from the yogic, yogic perspective is represent the four lower chakras of Muladhara, Swadhisthana, Manipura, Anahata and Shiva she is lying on that is like a mattress that is represented here at the Vishuddhi chakra and here at the Agnya chakra is Devi herself. Okay? So many of the concepts that you see everything is explained in an easy to relate manner. If you say only in the term of chakras and these things, many people don't understand. So it is with, when you have pictures, when you have forms, you can relate to it easily. And from there, the questioning begins. So why? Why is she sitting on these deities? Why does she have to sit? Why can't she have a regular throne? Why, why does she have to sit on these deities? And why is she sleeping on Shiva? So these, this questioning starts. So what we see is always one layer. And you have to start peeling back the layers to try to understand why something is depicted in a certain way. Even the Puranas, even whether it is Ramayana, Mahabharata, the uh, 18 Puranas, all of them have symbolic meanings. So the story is the way to get you in, to rope you in, to get you, you know, hooked. And once you are hooked, then the questioning begins and then you want to find out more, know more, and then you start, you know, trying to understand and then you get... Uh, mm, you want to get into a serious study of what all of this is about. And on the two deities on either side of her, one on uh, our left, her right is Lakshmi and on her left is Saraswati. So these are two further aspects of the goddess and we'll come to that also. And right in front of her are the two children, Ganapati and Subramanya. So these are supposed to be the children of Shiva and Shakti. So although they are shown as children and all of this is described in terms that we can relate to. 
we know what a family is we know who who husband is or a wife is and who the children are when they when we talk of these things in those terms we can very easily connect with them and the connect is what is important ganapati you know but the conception is not something that happens in the usual sense of the word so it's a, in ladha sastram again you have um what is that one kameshwara mukhaloka kalpita shri ganeshwara so she just looked at shiva devi just looked at him and ganesha was born that's that is how the description comes okay so all of them you have to go beyond what is just given in the texts so that is the uh, thing for this so a study of shri vidya involves three you can say that you know the building of shri vidya if you like you can call it that way the rests on three things the mantra yantra and tantra of these we are very familiar with mantra right we all know that they are not just random random syllables or anything is just been put together they have been revealed to the sages right so it's uh, um, energy fields that are created when a mantra is chanted the energy of that devata is supposed to be present there okay so there are certain syllables they are called as seed syllables because they have the potentiality to bring that deity in your presence okay so for example when you say gum that is a bija that is related to ganapati dram is a bija related to dattatreya dattatreya is a form of brahma vishnu and rudra together okay um some of you may not be familiar with who these deities are but don't worry about it it's the sound syllable and the deity that are going together okay so these are um, the mantras are highly potent and uh, by constantly repeating the mantras they say manana trayati iti mantra so what is a mantra it is something that creates that energy field by constantly repeating it so when you constantly repeat the same mantra over and over again you are creating that vibrational energy field there and that has the power to interact with you and you can um you know uh, express your desires or you can express whatever it is that you wish to that deity so one is the mantra there is a, a small story here where uh, you know just to give you an idea of what what mantras can do there is a, a young boy who is tending to buffaloes and he goes and he is you not know, taking care of these buffaloes and there is a wise man who is going by and he is very thirsty so he asks him can i have some water so he says of course and then he gives him some water to drink and then this wise person wants to bless him he says you know you have given me water and i would like to bless you so he says no no that that's okay you don't need to do anything but he says no i i i want to bless you what is your favorite thing in the world so this boy was not sure what to say so he said uh, my favorite thing is buffalo okay so because he is tending to buffaloes so he says i like buffaloes <laughs> very much so he says okay so he gives him the mantra and he says bhai soham okay that is the mantra he has given and he he go he goes away and a few months later he comes back and then uh, you know he hears some noises from a cave so this this boy he actually goes into a cave and he keeps chanting this mantra bhai soham bhai soham he keeps chanting that mantra this this wise person he comes back to that area and then he sees and he says uh, you know he can hear some strange sounds coming and then he goes there and then he says and then he remembers that the little boy was uh, there so he says you come out come out now no need it's enough you come come out you don't need to chant a mantra anymore he says no i cannot come out i'm too big he has become the buffalo so he has become as big of as the buffalo and he he says i cannot come out now so because uh, you know maybe the faith and maybe the complete implicit trust that he had in what was told to him and he experienced that he had himself become the buffalo and he says i cannot come out because i'm you know i'm i've become big when when he went into the cave he was just a small boy bhai so hum bhai is is i am buffalo, I am buffalo. so that that is the mantra that was given okay <laughs> so i am a buffalo so in today what we do all the healing affirmations whatever we do we are constantly reaffirming who we are so these are the mantras 
right? So our mantras also consist of usually two parts. One is the what are the called as the bija aksharas, which are the seed potentialities, and the second part is somewhat explanatory type of a, uh, a part that is joined to the mantra. So uh, usually, even if you translate the mantra, you can't. There is no translation for the bija letters. The bija aksharas are uh, irre irreplaceable parts of the mantra. And there may be other parts where it is a description of the deity or something, which sometimes can be, you know, uh, translated into something, or you can at least have a meaning for that. Okay. So that uh, about mantras, we all know. Okay. The second part is a yantra. The literal meaning of the word yantra is a machine okay, or a technique. Sorry, uh, tool. So this yantra, this one, what you see here is a shri yantra. Okay. A yantra is generally, again, it is formed out of triangles, petals, circles, squares, all geometrical figures. So it's also known as sacred geometry for that reason. Why? Again, it is creating that energy field. Just like the mantra, the yantra also creates that energy field with the help of all of these geometries. And once that is in place, then the deity is supposed to reside right in the center, in the bindu. The bindu is the central point and that is where the deity is supposed to reside. So mantra is there and yantra. And just as you have different deities, how do you recognize which deity is which? Because of the weapons that they hold in their hands. The weapons or whatever it is that they are holding in their hands. If they are holding two lotuses, it is Lakshmi. If in the earlier image we had one of uh, on the left, on our right, that in white sari, she is holding a musical instrument, right? A string instrument. She is Saraswati. So, depending on what the deity is holding, you can identify who that deity is. Okay? So, similarly, even for the yantras, every deity has a particular yantra that is um, unique to that deity. So, if it is a Ganapati yantra, it is in one particular way. It is, if it is a Kali Yantra, it is in a particular way. If it is a Sri Yantra, it is in a particular way. So it is, it is predefined. Again, these are not uh, something that some people said, okay, if I put a few petals here, it looks nicer. Maybe I'll make it, you know, uh, more attractive, put a few more lines, put some more circles, whatever. It doesn't happen that way. So these things are very uh, strict uh, ways of doing the uh, the pattern or the thing is is uh, it's revealed. It is not something that is uh, again uh, decided by anybody that I want to do it in this particular way. It's not like a, a you know a floor design that you make and then you can keep expanding it however you like. It's not like that. It is uh, set in a certain way because these are revealed knowledge. Okay. So and that is about the yantra. And then what is tantra? So here we know. Tantra, the definition is tanoti trayati iti tantraha. Tanoti, tanoti means to stretch or to expand. And what is it that is being stretched or expanded? It is our consciousness. So instead of limiting ourselves again to I, me and mine, we are expanding that concept of I, me and mine to I, me and you, I, me and my neighbors, I, me and my family and extended family and so on until you, you feel an identity with the whole universe. Okay? So that is the concept of Tantra, expanding the consciousness. And Tantra is a combination of Mantra and Yantra. The two are used, the technique that is used in combining the Mantra and the Yantra and offering the worship. So all of these are given in a very coded manner. How is it that you are supposed to do these rituals? So the power comes from the ritual itself and also the mantra that is used, the yantra that is used and how these two things are combined. That is what gives the power. Okay. And why have all these pujas and all these practices been kept secret for so, so long is because for the very reason that they are so powerful. Because power corrupts, absolute power corrupts absolutely. So 
uh, you know, power in the wrong hands, when you are not yet ready to be able to use that power in a wise manner, then it is a danger not only to you yourself, but to the entire world. And so it has been said, you know, you have to reach a certain level of maturity before you can be given these mantras, before you can do these practices. On the other hand, in today's world, where everything is available on the internet, everything, if people who are in the know and who do know how to go about these practices in the correct way, if they do not, you know, teach these practices to others, then what is going to happen? The no wrong knowledge or people who are willing to propagate anything, that will be taken as the true knowledge and the real traditions will suffer. That will get lost in the process and the rest will, um, you know, will go around as being the truth. So instead of that, now everybody realizes that yes, it is the time to open up these things. Now whether, if you are not ready for it, you probably won't even bother to practice it, that's fine. But the knowledge should be available, it should be made available to everybody and you can decide whether you wish to practice it or not. But just for that, it need not be kept secret any longer. So uh, Guruji used to say, you know, if terrorists can uh, hold the hold the whole population, you know, in this thing just by videos and these things and, you know, creating terror. Why cannot we use technology for creating good in the world? So we should use all the means that are there available to us to spread the knowledge of Sri Vidya. How it is, how can you interact with these practices? How can you see for yourself and manifest the changes in your own life? So this is what Sri Vidya is all about. Okay, so yeah, mantra represents a sound form of the deity. These are different yantras. The first one is a Ganapati yantra, next one is uh, Shyama and Varahi. These are also two forms of the goddess, many, many forms of the goddess and Tantra. So this is an example of what uh, a puja looks like. When you're using a yantra, there is at the top of the person, at the top the, is depicting the deity and at the bottom is, this is like an aerial view, the bottom is the person who is actually doing the worship, okay? And in the center, you have the yantra. So the yantra actually acts like a, a mirror. So it's mirroring your actions. So the ultimate is that you realize your identity with the deity whom you are worshipping. So how that happens is through the yantra. Tantra is the practices themselves. How you combine the mantra and the yantra. All of these are have been given in uh, the what are known as the Parashrama Kalpa Sutras, which is like the text for Sri Vidya. So these texts are, uh, I think they are uh, in what century, fourth, fifth century, something like that. Um, and uh, these have been uh, all the things are given, but it's given in a coded manner. So even if a lay person just goes through the book, you will not understand it. The mantras are given, but it's again everything is coded. So you have to decipher the code and then figure out what it is. And uh, more often than not, you will not be able to get it. So although it is given, you still have to go through the proper channels of getting in touch with a person who is a guru and whom you can go to for guide guidelines, for guidance, for uh, being able to understand what it is all about. So, you know, before we get there, yeah. So this is an example of Tantra, Tantra in action, okay. What is it that you see? You see a yantra that is drawn, this is a Sri Yantra that is drawn on the floor and you see a lot of people sitting all around and the object of this group empowerment ritual is that all of us feel that we are one person, right. So we we look at ourselves and we say, I am different from you, you are different from her and she is different from someone else. But to realize that we are all one, there are certain rituals that we do and one of them is this kind of a ritual. We will be having such a ritual here also on uh, I think March 3rd or something like that. Okay, so this is a positive example of Tantra. The Tantra has gotten a bad name uh, simply because it has not been understood properly in the right 
manner. So both the West and the East, no, 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 nobody is uh, you know, above, <laughs> above the law. So both have had their own interpretations and both are not correct. So the balanced view, what is Tantra? It, is, it creates a balance between everything. Okay, so. Because we all know what is the Western wrong. Yeah. Eastern, it is uh, connected with black magic, witchcraft, and uh, you know, always using the power of the mantras, using the power of these rituals to do harm to others. So, you know, that is why the power, the, uh, the thing comes in, that you need the maturity to be able to handle these mantras, right? So, we know it is not the fault of the mantra, right? It is not the fault of the nuclear bomb or it is not the fault of the knife. Used in the right way, all of these have you know, wondrous opportunities, wondrous uh, uh, benefits to mankind. But in the wrong hands, they are of, you know, they don't benefit anybody. So that is, uh, uh, you know, why it has been kept uh, secret. And uh, see, but so this is like a, a place where all, you know, you uh, invoke all the powers within that yantra into ourselves and we worship also the yantra that is there outside. So this is uh, a way, a positive way of the empowerment that happens in Tantra. Okay. So we, we tend to see only one aspect of it. When you take something out of context and try to explain it, it doesn't work. So it is a highly scientific approach. It has very set guidelines, set ways of doing certain things. And uh, when you do those things in the, in the way that is prescribed, definitely you, you do see the results. Okay? So and uh, in, in the days to come, you will be learning some very simple rituals. And we invite you to make use of those rituals. You set a sankalpa for yourself. Do that practice for 44 days, 45 days, and see how it can benefit you. Because only by experience will you be able to understand that yes, this has something, right? So it is like, a, like an experiment, a scientific experiment. So you don't need to take anything at face value. You have to experiment and you have to do that thing for yourself, find out if it does work or not, okay? So that is the beauty of this in the sense that, you know, questioning is not wrong. You need to question, you have to question because if you don't question, then you are, you are nowhere. By questioning, you are trying to understand. So. Uh, you question things, you understand, and then you uh, learn from that, and you get the benefits of doing whatever it is you want. This is, yeah, sure. Okay. Yes, yes. Uh, then uh, I'm just curious, what is then the history of moving from the east to the west into such a uh, exclusive uh, sexuality interpretation? Where does this? Explain? Yes, there is a basis for that, but again. It was taught only to a very few at a very mature level after they had reached, only then were they taught those practices. Okay. So till then it was 99.9999% it of the people were not taught the practices at all. But to a very few people who were uh, deemed uh, ready for such practices, because uh, the thing with Tantra is that you can get results like that. Right? So, because of that, people misuse. So, they use the mantras, use this thing and try to get, it's again all for personal benefit. But the moment you start using things for your own personal benefit and ignore the benefit of the universe, you are getting into trouble. When you do the practices to include the benefit of the entire mind, mankind at large, you are there in that mankind also. Right? So you don't need to make a separate sankalpa or separate intention for yourself. When your intention is for the benefit of the entire universe, then your needs are taken care of as well. There's a, more than the mother, more than the divine goddess, who knows, right? You yourself may not be able to express what your desires are, what you may not even know, because they're at a, such a subtle level. You yourself may not know, but she knows. So she can help you to manifest those desires, right? And uh, you know, not uh, you don't need to worry about that. As long as you are constantly working for the good of mankind, for everybody. When when the whole universe 
is your uh, uh, playing ground, then you, you are such a tiny, tiny, tiny part of it. You will be taken care of. And never to worry about that. Okay. Uh, I don't know. Are you okay with the answer? Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. This is a picture of Guruji worshipping Amma. Okay. This is to show that the divinity is present not only in a metal yantra, not only in an idol, which is made maybe of marble, maybe of stone or something like that. But the place, the real place where the goddess lives is within all of us. So she is the consciousness again that is present in us. And when we honor that consciousness, she is pleased. So, uh, Suva, what is it? Uh, Suva Sinyarchana Prita. She is known as she, she is very fond if you worship her in the form of living beings. Okay. She must be worshipped in the living form as well. So in our culture, in the Hindu culture, we have simple ways of worshipping. Anybody comes home, we offer them tilakam, we give them a fruit. That is the simplest form. Okay, It has come down to that. And then for uh, special occasions, then we have uh, where, where married ladies will exchange, uh, you know, small gifts or something like that. All this is a form of this uh, Suvasini puja as it is called. So this puja is uh, done where, see, now there is no question where the person who is being worshipped is Shakti. The person who is doing the worship is Shiva. Okay. So when you can forget everything else and you are only doing the worship from that point of view, then you can, you know, do the worship. So it is, you know, you have to go to a place where there is no passion. The puja, the worship is happening where there is no passion. But yet, it is, uh, no, it is completely, the nature of the worship is full of passion. But at the same time, you have to remain dispassionate. And that is where all the trouble is, where it is, where people find it difficult. But people make use of this and say, you know, okay, I can do this, you give, you give it a different name, and then uh, what it ends up being is just for pleasure. Okay. So in some cultures, they advise that you do these practices between the husband and wife. So then there is no danger of it becoming, you know, uh, debasing society or anything like that. So if it is between the married couple, so one, you, the practices are taking you to different levels, and even if the practice does not reach the highest state that is supposed to take you and you and it end up in, ends up in a normal relationship then also that's fine right but when you are involving other people people from you know with whom you have no connection and you are uh, you know making a, a situation where people can point fingers at you and say that you are not supposed to be doing this or you know worshiping uh, uh, young girls or as we see you know in the, the uh, that's that's where this tantra has got all the bad name because you know worshiping in this manner is supposed to give you quick results and uh, powerful results and so you know these things are used but the true purpose and the true uh, science behind the tantra has been lost tantra is meant for expanding your consciousness it is entirely for spiritual reasons okay the you may argue with the means and say, is this a valid means? But these, these means are have been handed down to us from the earlier times. They are valid means. At the same time, if they are not used in the correct context and not used in the correct ways, then it can end up becoming totally uh, not what it is intended for. So that is the danger. It is like, you know, walking on a knife's edge. So if you don't do it in the way it is intended, then you can end up in trouble. If you do do it, if you can do it in the way it is meant to be done, then you will, you know, you, you will get the benefits and you will be able to uh, go forward very well. So, that is an example. Okay, then this is the, the powers of Devi. She is uh, what is known as Icha Shakti, Jnana Shakti and Kriya Shakti. These are the primordial ways in which she uh, brings to manifestation. So if you want to create anything, 
and I think Neelima will tell us very well, before creating the Shakti Kum, first what happens is the desire that arises in you, the thought, okay, that is called Ichha Shakti, that is the desire, this is, okay, I have an idea, I want to do this. Now next, you have to start exploring, you have to start seeing how is it going to be possible. You start reading books, you start talking to people, you start, uh, you know, uh, uh, thinking more and more about it and seeing, is this really something that will be a good thing, you know, find out from everybody, see what is the history, see what, you know, how do we want to take this forward. So you start gathering all the knowledge pertaining to your idea. So that is Jnana Shakti. The first is the desire, second is the knowledge. And the third is the actual manifestation, the actual birthing, as we were talking about yesterday, the actual bringing into a reality. That is the Kriya Shakti. So once the thought process has been worked out, the, everything has been put into place, then the actual manifestation will take place, okay. So the, these are the three mothers, they are called three mothers, Ichha Shakti, Jnana Shakti and Kriya Shakti. So they take care of the different aspects of manifestation and once something has been manifested, then it is again transferred to Lakshmi. Now once this, this uh, gathering of Kumbh is over, we have to continue to nurture it and we have to continue to, you know, uh, make sure that people are still connected. So all that, so we are taking it back to Lakshmi. So she is going to nourish and protect it. And then again, it goes back to Saraswati. So it's like how when a child is born, child is born out from desire, then it is it grows and then the child is born. Once the child is born, again, it is nourished from the uh, breasts of the mother. So that is the, uh, the uh, Lakshmi and then back to knowledge. So until you come back to the knowledge, so this play of these three mothers keeps going round and round and round. And that is described in the uh, circle, Saraswati, Lakshmi, Kali. Lakshmi, Saraswati, Saraswati, Lakshmi, Kali. So this is the triangle, the central triangle, Ichha Shakti, Jnana Shakti, Kriya Shakti. So for manifestation to happen, these three energies are the basic energies that are needed for manifesting anything, whatever it is. So if it is a simple sculpture, painting, uh, a design, whatever it is you want. First is the desire. That is the first thing that comes. Then comes the uh, knowledge that you need to be able to create it. Then the actual act of creating it. And then how do you nurture and protect it and then spread the knowledge about that. Okay. So these three aspects, Ichha Shakti, Jnana Shakti and Kriya Shakti. So just again very briefly, this is the Guru Parampara to which we belong and at the bottom is our Guruji, Sri Amritananda Nath Saraswati and we'll learn a little bit more about him and his story tomorrow. Uh, his Guru is Sri Saprakashananda Tirtha Hamsa Abhuta. He is um, he's an ascetic and his outlook and way of uh, perceiving the world uh, was very much... Uh, appreciated by our Guruji and he accepted him completely. He has a place even in our temple, within the, the temple complex. And his Guru is somebody very close here. He was from Haridwar. He is from the Bhadrakali Peetham in Haridwar. So Kalyanananda Bharati is his name. So so maybe yeah, <laughs> you know, we are all connected at some level. So yeah, we we'll come back to the roots perhaps. Yes. So this, this is the uh, Guru Parampara to which we belong. So we will give you, uh, we will just chant these once because of the, uh, you know, we are tight on time. We will chant the mantras once and we will practice these mantras tomorrow and in the days to come. Okay. So um, don't be too concerned that maybe you are not pronouncing it carefully or uh, whatever. Okay. So you will be receiving four mantras for learning the practices that follow in the next few days. It is ideal for you to have the mantras. See, if without the mantra, receiving the mantra and you just do it, the um, efficacy is not as much, all right? So if you take the mantras and do it, you will find, and like I said, if you make the intention and then you test it out for yourself, go ahead and do that 
and then you can see the other thing. Um, only the Guru Mantra, we have not given you the full Guru Mantra because if you are truly interested, then we will initiate you to into in the Guru Mantra of the Guruji. But the Ganapati Mantra, Bala Mantra and Chandi Mantra, these three mantras we will be giving you. Guru Mantra, we are giving like a generic mantra, which is Guru Brahma, Guru Vishnu, Guru Devo Maheshwaraha, Guru Sakshat Parabrahma, Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha. So, which is, Guru is the form of Brahma because he is giving you a spiritual birth. Just as Brahma is the creator, Guru creates you by giving you birth to you spiritually. He is Vishnu because he nourishes, protects, guides, counsels you along the way. And he is also Guru Maheshwara. So, he is the one who, uh, you know, dissolves you, dissolves your identity with the body, it dissolves your identity with the mind and the ego and makes you understand that you are the ultimate reality. So he is the Brahma, he is the Vishnu, he is the Maheshwara and he is truly the Parabrahma. So to such a Guru, I bow down. So that is the Guru Mantra. It's a generic mantra. If people are interested in following the practices further post this event, then we will definitely, we will initiate, we will have a program where we can have the initiation for the full Guru Mantra, okay. So, uh, this is just, because we don't want it to be, uh, you feel pressurized in any way, because it is possible that you may have already received a Guru Mantra from someone else or whatever. So, this is an option, we are doing it in this way. If you are truly interested, you are most welcome and we can, you know, take the thing further through the, so imagine, at the Sahasrara Chakra, a pair of feet facing the same direction as your own feet. Okay. So imagine the two feet there, one foot belongs to Shiva, one, be one foot belongs to Shakti. And imagine that you are washing these divine feet which are placed on top of your head. And chant, Guru Brahma, Guru Vishnu, Guru Devo Maheshwaraha Guru Sakshat Parabrahma Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Once more, repeat. Guru Brahma Guru Vishnu Guru Devo Maheshwaraha Guru Sakshat Parabrahma Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha So these are the two feet of the Guru. They represent introspection and enlightenment. So it is for you to constantly introspect and the sparks of understanding represent the enlightenment that can happen. We move to the next mantra which is the Mahaganapati mantra. Place your awareness and focus at the Muladhara chakra. You all know that it is at the very base, at the tip of the spinal cord. And repeat. Om Shreem Om Shreem Kleem Glaum Gam Ganapataye Varavarada Varavarada Sarvajanam Sarvajanam Me Vashamanaya Me Vashamanaya Swaha Swaha Once more Om Shreem Om Shreem Hreem Kleem Glaum Gam Ganapataye Varavarada Sarvajanam 
मे वशमानय नेक्स्ट मंत्र इज कॉल्ड द बाला मंत्र विच हैज थ्री सीड सिलेबल्स विच आर चैंटेड इन द फॉरवर्ड एंड द रिवर्स डायरेक्शन place your awareness in succession at the tip of the tongue at the breasts at the yoni and in the reverse at the yoni in the breasts and the tip of the tongue okay i am i clean sauho 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 clean I am. I am. Clean. Sauh. Sauh. Clean. I am. The final mantra is the Chandi mantra, which is an excellent mantra to have for protection. from all kinds of negative influences so whenever a seeker begins on his journey like we have seen there are many obstacles that come so she offers you protection from every angle here the visualization is first at the yoni then your left breast and the right breast then the navel and then again at the yoni okay aim aim clean chamundayai chamundayai vichche vichche aim aim clean chamundayai chamundayai vichche so these are the four mantras that you will require during this course it is said of shri vidya a small uh, this thing shri guru paduka murdhni who has his guru's feet on the top of his head shri chakram hrudi samsthitam the one who holds the shri chakram in his heart shri vidya yasya jivva agre the one who has the mantra of shri vidya always on his tongue sa sakshat parameshwara so he is truly the ultimate reality who is none other than shiva so this is what is said of shri vidya and why should you learn why should you take the trouble we are all aspiring to become yoginis where what you say what you think and what you do have to be synchronized have to be one and she is the primordial energy who is worshiped by no less than 64 crores of yoginis so she is worshiped by the entire universe okay so this is a a good reason for us to at least understand her and try to go towards her she is waiting she is the mother she is waiting for us so let us go and embrace her thank you shri matri namaha jai ma jai ma jai gange shri matri namaha